I'd like to thank the, the um, organisers for inviting me. I'm one of a very small number from the European Union. Um, I'm going to talk particularly about wheat and about wheat composition. I'd like to start by pointing out, as other speakers have, that although wheat's a fairly new crop, it's immensely diverse. Something like 25,000 lines in gene banks, and I was told only last week we've got 25,000 lines in China alone. So there's probably more like 50,000 nowadays. So an, an immense degree of variation. I'll talk a little bit about protein content, but mainly on phytochemicals and what we think of as bioactive components. If we get time, and I've got a lot of slides, um, I'll, go, I'll talk about substantial equivalence and spray into peas and beans at the very end. The first point I'd like to make is that we tend to treat grain as homogeneous tissues, and of course they're not. They're mixtures of tissues, and the tissues vary very much in composition. Because of this, if you get a large grain, it will have a different composition to a small grain because there will be less dilution with starch. So people often tell me these crops are very good, they've got high protein, they've got high bioactives, and of course they've got low starch, they've got low yield, and there's less dilution. So it's important to remember that the yield is driven by starch, and when we have more starch, we dilute everything else. Uh, a lot of data can be interpreted in that respect. What we always do is plot our data sets against seed size before we do anything else. I'd also like to point out that um, these outer layers are very rich in some of the bioactive components. I'll talk a little bit about protein because people get quite excited about protein content. In our experiments, protein content is largely determined by the environment. This is just a small experiment from Rothamsted, only six varieties on, on the same site for three years and with three nitrogens. And I've coloured the, the, the data according to the nitrogen application, the year, and the variety, and I've plotted grain N against grain yield. And we have this characteristic inverse correlation between grain N and grain yield. But you can see, what you see is a very clear separation based on nitrogen. So the protein content in this sample set, which includes high protein wheat for bread making, and so one low protein wheat for animal feed, the main determination is by agronomy, there's a small year effect, and the variety effect is hidden um, amongst all the other noise. So in our hands, at least, and in wheat, protein content is not very strongly controlled by the genetics compared by the environment. A lot of the data I'll talk about will come from the Health Grain Programme. This is a European Union programme, a Framework 6 programme, and it was aimed to improve the nutritional properties of wheat, particularly focusing on whole grain products. It's included a diversity screen, and we've probably spent about 3 million euros on this over a five-year period. And we started with 150 wheat lines and we grew them on a single site. So we started with a single, single sample set. This is not perfect, um, but then the analyses are very expensive and we had to, to make some compromises. So we started with 150 lines on one site, a diverse collection. We grew 50 other cereals so we could put the variation in wheat in the context of a wider variation in cereals. And then we took 26 varieties and we grew those on the same site for an additional two years and on an additional three sites. So we had six data sets of G times E for the 26 weeks. So what it enabled us to do is look at the genetic variation in wheat itself, this 150 lines, put this in the context of other cereals and to start looking at the, the G times E effect and to calculate the heritability of the composition that we're looking at. We, we sent the material all over Europe to our partner labs and this is all wet chemistry so it's all time consuming, so mainly using mass specs or in some cases NMRs also a lot of HPLC work and looks at all these range of components. And what I'll start, I'll do is to give you some data sets for, for some of these components and I'll try and bring it together at the end into some multivariate studies. But B vitamins, I won't talk about minerals today, phenolics, NMR, polar metabolites, some major components, a lot of dietary fibre work and working on various um, sort of fractions. So just some data sets just to illustrate the sort of data that we got. And it's worth bearing in mind here I've plotted total sterols. In fact, we broke the sterols down to all the individual types. So the data sets are much bigger than this. And these are the different species we looked at. There's 130 winter wheats and there's 20 spring wheats. Only five spilts, 10 rye, five oats, 10 dicocum and monococum primitive wheats, 
10 pastoral weeks and 10 barleys. So small numbers of these lines, very large numbers of wheat here, but you can see already that there's a quite a tight clustering of, of, the, of the wheat lines here. There's some species differences. Oats tends to be low in sterols. Rye tends to be high. And you begin to get a feel for the variation in wheat compared to the variation in other cereals. Look at the bottom here. I've just put the percent stanols. The stanols are a saturated form of sterols. And we, the, red, the wheat varieties are again shown here in purple spread out a little bit. And we can again start separating some of the species based on their steel, on their steel content and their stanol content. The, the sort of tocols, there's a number of forms that I've just put total, the total tocols here, and they include vitamin E compounds, very, very wide ranging wheat. So thinking back to your, remember the steel range was, was quite tight, the tocol range is very wide. Not much separation between species, apart from oats here at the bottom, which tends to be low. The tocotrienols have three double bonds and massive variation in the proportion of tocotrienols. Um, and again, not a great separation between species. Alcohol resorcinols, this sort of wiggly worm here. These are phenolic lipids. They're very good biomarkers for whole grain products. So nutritionists like them, but if they're not metabolized, you can pick them up in the serum. So you can actually tell how much whole grain people have eaten rather than have to rely on them to use in food diaries. They're not present in oats. They're very high in rye, and again, a very, very tight cluster here. There's 150 varieties. They're all very tightly clustered together. And here I've shown some of the more detailed analysis of the chain length of these, these components. Phenolic acids, um, massively variable. We separate them into three groups. The three phenolic acids, which are sort of soluble in water, sort of the bound, which are bound to the cell walls, and they're about 80% of the total. These are about 5% of the total. The soluble conjugated are conjugated to sugars, to sterols, and to other components, and they're soluble. All forms very variable. If you look at the totals, again, very variable, and particularly wheat here, you see, has a massive range as, very, as wide as in any of the other species. You can see some separation. Oats is very rich in free phenolic acids, but such limited separation between species. And then some work on B vitamins. Particularly interested in folate because wheat's an important source of folate in the diet. Not much variation between the species and a very, very tight clustering here, here of our wheat species, of, of, of our wheat varieties. 150 wheats in that, in that small cluster. Now that's the data from the 150 lines and the 50 other cereals. If we look at the G times E data from the, the six environments, we can start to portion that variation between the between the variety, the environment, and the G times E, the variety times the environment. And these are only very approximate for proportions, but they give an indication for plant breeders as to whether it's realistic to start breeding for this trait, or whether they're going to have problems because of the environmental effect. The year long, as I show you, were a very tight group, and they are quite highly heritable, over 50% of the variation. Alcohol and source holes were very tight. Again, they're quite heritable. The tocols were quite spread out, but again, there's a high heritability. The folates, there's less than 50% of the variation heritable. The, so the other 50% is either environmental or G times E. And work with, work with our colleagues at um, Claremont Ferrand have found it very difficult to select the folate content. And then the phenolic acids I show you were in, immensely variable, very small variety effect, and a very strong environment effect. So we're beginning to get a feel not only for the range of variation in, in wheat and how this relates to other species, but also to which of these components are ones that we can realistically select for in plant breeding programs if we want to improve the health benefits of wheat. We've gone back and looked at, looked at some more B vitamins. This is just a G times E set. This is the sort of raw data we get from the G times E analysis. These are the genotypes, 26 wheats. These, in this case, are four sites, and you can see in this case, this is vitamin B3. There we are. There's almost no effective genotype, very strong effective environment. So almost no difference between the varieties, but a very big environmental effect. So again, this is vitamin B2, a much tighter sort of data set, but in this case, we do have a strong effect of, of genotype. So not much variation, but a strong genetic control. So again, we can start perhaps picking some of these outliers, slightly high and slightly low types, and start to do some selection. Quite a lot of our work's been on dietary fibre because we're interested in the benefits of fibre. And fibre itself is very variable in composition and amount between the different tissues. 
Um, it's mainly arabinozidone and beta-glucan, and we looked particularly at the white flower, and we looked at the whole brand, and the whole brand are, are both very rich in arabinozidone and, and beta-glucan. A little bit of detail on structure. Beta-glucan is a series of, sort of glucose molecules. It's mainly 1,3 linked, and occasionally there's a 1,4 link, is giving us a slight kink in the chain here. And so this gives us a, a degree of structural variation. We can look for this structural variation between individual varieties. And the way we look for it is we digest with a lichenase enzyme, which cuts just here, and this releases some fragments of either three residues or four or larger, depending on the distribution of these, these 1,4 linkages. So we can fingerprint beta-glucan based on fragment length, and xylan we can also fingerprint. xylan is more complicated. It's got a xylan backbone. It can be substituted in either one position here, the three position with the rabinose, or two positions, the two and three with the rabinose. And again, we can, finger, we can fingerprint this by using an endoxylanase. The endoxylanase will cut the xylan chain, that will release oligo, oligosaccharides, and we can use these as a fingerprint to look for structural variation. But if first we look at the total amounts, and what we've done here is rather than look at whole mill in the previous slides, we looked at flour at the top here, and we looked at bran, and the ravenous xylan we've divided into the soluble, the water soluble of ravenous xylan, and the, and the total. And we're interested in soluble because of the specific health benefits. And in the middle here, we have whole mill beta glucan. And again, you can look at species differences. You see that rye is very rich in water extractable ravenous xylan in flour, so a good source of soluble fiber. It's also a good source of insoluble fiber in flour. We already know that bard is very rich in beta-glucan, oats is very rich in beta-glucan. So we're beginning to see some variation between species. We also have quite interesting variation in wheat itself. We're doing a lot of work at the moment with this variety, which is very, very high in soluble fiber, and it's a strong genetic control. Again, we can apportion the variation with the G times E data set, and in this case, there's lots of blue on the slide, which shows that the heritability is high for most of these fibre components. And so we're very um, interested now in working with plant breeders to try and develop this into commercial cultivars, because we think we can improve the soluble and the total fibre content in the diet by selecting for this variation. And I, I mentioned fingerprinting. If we use the two enzymes, the xylanase and the gluconase, the lichenase, we can then separate the oligosaccharides on an HPLC, and we can look at the peaks, and these are the glucan peaks, the G3 and the G4 that I, I mentioned earlier, and there's other smaller ones up here. These are different xylan peaks, that's one xylose, two xylose. These are different structures of the ravenous xylan, oligo, oligosaccharides. And this is a, a very sort of clear fingerprint, and we can treat it as a, a data set for PCA analysis and start asking what the difference is and what the range of differences between these varieties. And when we do this, this is work carried out by Luke, by Luke Sornia at Nantes, get a very nice separation, and the main separation on the first principal component is the monosaturated, the, the monosubstituted rather, to disubstituted. The second separation here is mainly on beta-glucan. So again, we can identify differences in the fine structure of the polymers and start exploiting these differences by using a, quite, a single thing, quite a simple fingerprinting method. What we've done now is to start combining the data sets using um, some multivariate analysis, initially PCA analysis, and seeing what we can do to discriminate the different species and within wheat, the different types of wheat, by using multiple analysis of these data sets. So this is looking at the phytochemical data set, um, taking all the data I showed you previously on the phytochemicals, but not the fiber components. And we can get a nice separation here of some of the species, oats is here, barley. So bread wheat is clustered in the middle here with some of the other wheats. If we do it with fiber, again, we can get a similar separation but bread wheat overlaps with some of the other wheats. But here we get a good separation of rye, which is higher in fibre, as I mentioned earlier. So we can start putting variation in wheat in the context of variation in other species. And for substantial equivalence, it means you can put your transgenic analysis into this sort of data set and see how it fits within the whole range of variation in wheat itself, rather than just comparing it with its control varieties. And we can look at this data set and see, what see what's, responsible, what's responsible for this separation here. So pick out the individual components. We can also combine the fiber and phytochemicals. And when we do this, we get a much cleaner separation. We get red wheat here overlapping with spilt, which of course is a variety of red wheat. 
only difference in one or two genes from bread wheat. Other wheat species overlap less and the other species give it quite a clear separation. Then we can go into the data set and say what discriminates one species. So we can put out the data and say that oats is discriminated here because it's particularly high in free phenolic acids. Here we have rye is very high in in trigonellin, which is a sort of methyl donor. Having put them in the context of all the whole, the whole um, data set, we can then look at wheat itself and we can look at the spread of variation in wheat using PCA analysis. And again, if we did this again with, the, with transgenic wheat and control wheat, we should be able to put the transgenic lines within this context of whether the variation in composition is inside or outside the normal range of variation we get for the species. I think that's what substantial equivalence is about. It's not being identical, it's about being within the range of variation you normally get. So I think this is quite a useful tool. You could, you could actually make a core collection of say 20 or 30 varieties and you could use this core collection to look at substantial equivalence. Okay. More recently we've been doing metabolomic analysis. Um, so we extract the flour, we, we deuterated methanol water, we put it in the NMR, we call the spectrum, and again we treat the NMR spectrum as a data set and we use this for fingerprinting, for pattern matching. When we take the data set for the NMR, we pick out major components, we can start looking at the different species here. So these are, some of these are the same components we looked at directly, but some are different. We have amino acids here, we have some sugars here, which we didn't look at in the other data set. But again, we can pull the individual components out of the NMR data sets and we can start saying, how does how does wheat, shown here in green, differ from other types of wheat, red wheat, other types of wheat, and other species. This is physical component one and two, and this is component two and three, and, and we get good separations in different um, sort of sets of principal components. And again, we can see what's responsible for this variation. And once again, we can do the same with bread wheat. We can just look at the, 50, the 150 bread wheat varieties. So this is PC1 here, PC2. PC2, PC3, and we can start looking at the range of variation and we start seeing interesting things because these are all, almost all from recent red wheats from Western Europe. So this is a sort of cluster, it's a sort of breeding cluster which have, have, a, have a common ancestry and the separation is actually showing this ancestry. So now we're going to start comparing this variation to sort of markers, to molecular markers to see to, to what extent they match up. And we can use the full data set. Previously I showed you the data sets where we've taken out major components. Here we can just treat everything as a, as a sort of pattern and we can look at all the different peaks. We have a replicates here as well. So if you run three replicates and these are the four sites in 2007, 26 varieties and we see night effects of the environment here on the varieties on the, on the different sites. This is one set of replicates, there's another set down here. So the replication is pretty good, but you still need to run three reps for these types of analysis. And of course with a 600 megahertz NMR it becomes quite expensive at this stage. Before we started doing that more detailed analysis, we did use metabolomics and we did this about 10 years ago. In 1998 we put transgenic wheat out in the field in the UK in two places, at Long Ashton near Bristol and in Harpenden. And we had four years of field trials, we had no problems at all. We had no destruction and we had no protesters and it was wonderful. Um, so these were lines that I generated or my colleagues and myself generated and the lines would improve bread making quality by increasing the number of glutenin subunits. It was really a controlled experiment, putting in extra subunits into different backgrounds and looking at bread making quality. Um, but we were interested in substantial equivalence. So at that time we had a smaller NMR of 400 megahertz but we did a similar sort of analysis. We extracted the polar metabolites, we run them on the NMR, and then we took the whole data set and we use it for pattern matching using PCA. And here I've shown the data set from the paper we published about 10 years ago. And I've coloured the data according to the year and site. So the sites here are pink, brown and red for Rotherstead in the east of England. You see they're all over this side. And orange, green and blue for Long Ashton, which is uh, the west of England and they tend to be over here. So we have two separate clusters for the two parts of the country and we have also separate clusters for the years. On this side I've coloured according to the control and transgenic lines and we do get some separation. There's one of the transgenics shown in red here which tends to be very high in this part and this has got a very high overexpression of the transgene. But generally you can say that the variation within 
between the transgenics and control lines is actually less than that between the sites and probably less than that between the years in most cases. So in most cases the lines here we would say were substantially equivalent in composition in terms of the polar metabolites to the controls and the major effect was the environment um, in terms of year and site. And we have no idea why the site had that effect. Okay, just to digress into peas and beans, we don't normally work on peas and beans. We don't grow much peas, many peas and beans in the UK. Um, but a few years ago, our Food Standards Agency became concerned about this report from Australia with TJ Higgins and colleagues about the, the transgenic peas expressing the bean inhibitor having in, increased immunogenicity. And people immediately thought this was increased allergenicity and got very concerned about it. They scrapped the whole experiment but our Food Standards Agency asked us to develop some methods to look at the substantial equivalence of these peas and beans to see if we could find any differences which might account for effects on allergenicity in the long term. The protein which is expressed in the transgenic pea is an alpha amylase inhibitor and it's glycosylated and the story from Australia from TJ Higgins was there was a difference in the glycosylation pattern and this was responsible for the immunogenicity. Because the glycosylation was different, it was more immunogenic when expressed in pea than in bean. So they gave us a grant for a few years with a group at Cambridge. We developed some methods to look at basically the, the sort of the, the, um, sort of the end glycan structure of the, of, of the transgenic protein. Again, this is all wet chemistry. We had to purify the protein, then digest it with the protease, then we took an end gluconase to strip off the the, the, sort of, the, the sort of glycan group, sorry, glyconase. Then we got rid of the enzyme, got rid of the peptides, and then we permethylated the glycans, and we put the glycans on the Maldi-Toff MS to give us a glycan profile. Um, so, quite a few purification steps. You can simplify it down. We got it down to one bean eventually, um, but it's quite a struggle. It's a mixture of proteins. But this, is the, but this is the alpha amylase here between the pea and the bean and you can see the spectra here and I've got a bigger version I think in the next slide. Yeah. This is a bigger version and these are the glycans that we separate, these are the sizes, the structures and this is the identity. And again this is a fingerprint. And what you can see in the fingerprint is firstly it's essentially the same glycans are present in bean and in transgenic pea. So there's no difference in the in the structure of the glycans, but there are differences in the proportions. So we have a peak here which is very small in the bean, it's probably bigger in the pea, and if you look through you see the proportions actually differ quite a bit between the, the protein from the transgenic pea and the protein from the bean. So again we tried to put this into some sort of context, and we decided that we'd look not only at bean, but also look at some, some relatives, the tepary bean and the lima bean, and again, we isolated the alpha amylase inhibitor, we isolated the, the glycans, and we ran them on the, mal on the, on the maldi -tof. And again, you can see some differences, not so much in the glycan spectrum, but in the proportions of glycans. So it struck me that this was very similar to a data set we got from NMR, so we could use a multivariate approach, and we could put this into a statistical program and display it to see whether we could recognize groups in terms of glycan structure of these different species. And in this case, we use something called canonical variance analysis. And I hope you're not going to ask you what it is, because our statisticians um, sort of told me it was the best thing to use at the time. Um, but I have got it explained on a piece of paper I can read later. Well, what you see, and this is taking the, the data for glycan distribution from those different, different samples. Yep, this is the last slide. It's a, it's a sort of miracle for me. Um, so here we have French bean up here. Here's the transgenic pea, just slightly below there, and these are the other two bean species, quite well separated. So you can ask the question here, is this substantially equivalent or not? If you put it within the context of beans, yes. If you put it within the context of the French bean, it is slightly different. But it's a, but it's a lot less different than the different bean species which are also consumed. So again, this provides a sort of tool that you can use for substantial equivalence. But you need to learn or decide where to draw the boundaries. Okay, well, I've gone very quickly. <coughs> I've tried to include a lot of data to just to, to, to illustrate the data sets. But what we've done with, with wheat is assemble the biggest data set that's ever been assembled and probably that ever will be assembled because it's been a very painstaking process. But we're now at the stage where we do understand variation within that selection of varieties. It's not the perfect selection. We had to make a decision on what to select very quickly and get them in the ground. 
Um, but it has given us a good background for sub assessing things like substantial variation, and it's given us an opportunity, I think, to start identifying components for improving the health benefits of wheat and incorporating these into breeding programs. So these are the people that did the work. These are all the health grain partners, Helsinki, Lund, Indra, Claremont, Rwanda, Nantes, Martin Vasher, um, Hungary again, um, Leuven in Belgium, and then IFI in Norwich. My colleagues at Rotterdam who did the phenolic acids and the metabolomics, and then the glycosylation was joint between ourselves at Rotterdam and our colleagues in Paul Dufay's group at Cambridge. So thank you very much. Hi, I'm Rick Goodman from the University of Nebraska. Thank you, Peter. It was a very nice talk and very interesting. I work on allergy, allergenicity of mm. genetically modified crops, so it's interesting also. I do a little work with um, TJ Higgins on that product. But um, in general, it is curious to me that we're looking at a lot of metabolites in some of the GM, and then we're looking for are they substantially equivalent and should we be concerned? Um, do we have good data that of the function of many of these metabolites and are they positive or negative and how much is too much and if you change consumption in your, you know, did you eat two grams today versus ten, what does that mean for health? Yeah, I mean, I think with the NMR, I'm sorry, the question was were these metabolites important for health and uh, is it really relevant, I think, the question. Yeah, well, 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 first I think it's only one approach. Um, and it's giving you, it we show you any major changes in the metabolome. In some cases, those components have health benefits, particularly betaine and choline, which are methadones in the homocysteine cycle. So we're looking at those, so we're not abstracting data sets and things like that, like that out of the data set. But in most cases, I think it will show you there's any gross disturbance in metabolism, um, which is probably the, probably the only way you can get an unintended effects, probably without unintended effects, you have no idea what to look for. So I think this sort of large scale screening does help. We, will, we also do um, some mass spec analysis, and so we strip the stream and have a mass spec data set, and we can put the two together. But you're right, um, it's very difficult to interpret. And if I may just kind of follow up, I mean it's very interesting, it's baseline data that I think is very important. Um, often when these studies are done, it's on very few samples, as you said, and we're not sure of environmental effects. So it's kind of hard, and when I'm, I'm not a, a physiologist or something like that, and when I look at some of the papers, the interesting papers on differences in metabolites, then I kind of scratch my head and I think, well, gee, it's statistically significant. So how do I interpret that? And often it's easy for me to misinterpret. So that's where I get a little bit concerned. Well, maybe I'd, yes, I mean, I'd, I suppose I'd like to say that when we started this project in 2005, we didn't intend to do this work. We expected there, were, there was enough information available to be able to identify lines which were useful. But we found we had to go back and do effectively a diversity screen. And so we spent the whole five years doing that. And it was fantastic. <laughs>